Hello again, I'm Dan Mitchell with the Cato Institute. Time for the final segment in the Center for Freedom and Prosperity's video series on the Laffer Curve. We've already talked about theory in part one and evidence in part two. So we know that good changes in tax policy lead to more taxable income, which means that tax rate reductions generate revenue feedback. Conversely, we also know that tax rate increases will hurt economic performance, and since this translates into less taxable income, it means tax hikes at the very least do not raise as much money as politicians want. This is common sense for people in the real world. Business owners know they would lose customers if they doubled their prices, so they would never assume that this is a realistic way to double revenue. Likewise, entrepreneurs always look for efficiencies because they understand that they can increase total profits if they can lower prices and attract more buyers. Unfortunately, common sense is a rare commodity in Washington, and the revenue estimating system is a perfect example. When Congress debates tax legislation, it relies on the Joint Committee on Taxation to prepare official revenue estimates. This committee, which is controlled by politicians from the tax writing committees, assumes that changes in tax policy have zero impact on the economy's overall performance. I'm not making this up. The JCT even admits on its website that, quote, the Joint Committee staff assumes that a proposal will not change total income and therefore holds gross national product fixed, end quote. Let's look at a couple of examples to understand what this really means. If Congress is debating a bill to double income tax rates, the Joint Committee on Taxation will assume that the economy's growth rate is unaffected, even though such a proposal would have a crippling impact on incentives to work, save, and invest. The Joint Committee on Taxation would even assume there is no macroeconomic impact if the Internal Revenue Code is put in the shredder and replaced by a simple and fair flat tax. It doesn't matter that growth has expanded and that more jobs have been created in the countries that have adopted a flat tax. The JCT ignores real-world evidence and instead relies on simplistic models. This system is known as static scoring, and for decades, experts have urged the JCT to modernize their methodology so that lawmakers have more realistic information when considering tax legislation. The recommended new approach, known as dynamic scoring, would estimate Laffer curve effects so that revenue projections are more accurate. Now, defenders of the status quo claim the JCT does dynamic scoring, but this is only true in the very limited sense that the models incorporate what are called microeconomic effects, such as people using more tax preferences to protect their income when tax rates increase. But this is like guessing who won a baseball game by looking at the score in the first inning. Yes, it's part of the answer, but only a tiny fraction of the information needed. Here's a real-world example. Back in 1989, I worked for Senator Bob Packwood of Oregon. As the ranking Republican on the Finance Committee, he sent a letter to the JCT asking how much tax revenue would be raised if the government confiscated every penny above $200,000. What did the JCT say? Well, on your screen, you can see Senator Packwood's November 14th floor statement in the congressional record. As the senator explained, the JCT estimated that this 100% tax rate would collect $104 billion in 1989 rising to $299 billion in 1993. And when Senator Packwood asked the bureaucrats whether this was realistic, they gave him the same revenue estimate, but included a footnote stating that, quote, these estimated taxes do not account for any behavioral response, end quote. This is sort of like the fiscal equivalent of, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? So why does this crazy system exist? There are two explanations. The charitable explanation is dynamic scoring is difficult. If you ask five economists to estimate how much faster the economy will grow under a flat tax, you'll probably get six different answers. So how then is the Joint Committee on Taxation supposed to measure revenue feedback? Another complication is that short-run answers are probably different than long-run answers. The 2003 tax rate reductions are a good example. The attached chart shows the JCT's estimate of revenues compared to what actually happened. In the first couple of years, the JCT was pretty close. They even overestimated the amount of revenues in 2004. But in more recent years, actual revenues have been considerably higher than the JCT estimate, presumably because lower tax rates on dividends and capital gains have improved economic growth, something the JCT makes no effort to measure. Another challenge is disentangling the effects of multiple policies. If politicians raise taxes and adopt protectionist policies at the same time, the economy will be hit pretty hard and it would be difficult to figure out which bad policy deserves which share of the blame. These are some of the reasons why dynamic scoring will never produce a 100% correct revenue estimate. But the key thing to understand is that it will produce an estimate 
that is much closer to the truth than static scoring. Let's now shift to the less benign reason why dynamic scoring isn't being used. Simply stated, some people like the fact that the current system is rigged against good tax policy. Congressional budget rules are designed to make it difficult, at least on paper, to approve legislation that increases the budget deficit. And since the JCT routinely overestimates the revenues that can be obtained by raising tax rates, and likewise exaggerates the revenues foregone when tax rates are lowered, static scoring tilts the playing field in favor of bigger government. And this is why the tax and spend crowd is dogmatically opposed to dynamic scoring. Let's close with an interesting observation. The Joint Committee on Taxation refuses to make its revenue estimating model public. Instead, the JCT operates in a totally non-transparent fashion, even though we taxpayers pay their salaries and finance their so-called model. Maybe it's time that we get to peek behind the curtain and see what we're getting for our money. I suspect we won't like the answer. And I bet the defenders of the status quo are against transparency because there's no way to defend static scoring in the cold light of day. I'm Dan Mitchell. On behalf of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, thanks for watching this series on the Laffer Curve. Please share these videos to help spread the word.